everybody. So another fantastic Scotland Data Science and Technology Meetup. Hoorah! Um, for those that are joining us for the first time, this is a format web-based that is uh, an equivalent of something that we've been running for a number of years now in the flesh. Scotland Data Science and Technology Meetup is a kind of joint venture between MBN Solutions and the Data Lab. And we regularly hold meetups up and down Scotland, um, centering around Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and occasionally elsewhere. Tonight is brought to you in special partnership with Fintech Scotland as part of their Fintech Scotland fortnight. A big shout out to the guys at Fintech Scotland, Stephen McKell and the crew doing some amazing stuff. If you haven't checked out um, Fintech Scotland, do so. Um, tonight, I've already asked you all to jump into chat to make sure the functionality is working. Um, chat is for chat, guys. Questions is for questions. So if you hover at the bottom, you'll see your little Q&A panel. If you have any questions for Martin, please put the questions into Q&A. And the reason for that is simple. It's much easier to find the questions if they're in the box mark Q&A than it is to dig through all the chat and find, try and find people's questions. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, timing this evening, Mr. Thorne, how long should we be, sir? Okay, so presentation is 20 minutes tops, and then we can have a chat after that, and then just... Brilliant. We are freestyling and flying by the seat of our pants this evening, which is the way I like it. Um, that's about it for me. Martin, I'm not going to intro you, mate. You can do a far better job introing yourself. So I'm now going to go, mate, mute, and I'm going to shut up. I'll keep working away in the chat and Q&A, mate. And I'll join back in again towards the end, but I will let you know if there's anything you need to know about. Sweet, thank you. You're welcome, buddy. Right, let's see if I can get this tech working. So hopefully that should be the screen share. Um, if it's not, can someone Rob tell me that it's not working? But I think it should be sharing working. fine, Martin. Mate, it's sharing fine. Sweet. So first of all, thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening or good afternoon or whatever it is you're, you're viewing this from. So. Uh, some house rules, first of all. I'm presenting from my basement. I have a one-year-old and a five-year-old. It might sound like war is breaking out upstairs, but it's just them playing. Um, the other thing is my five-year-old's decided he's a ninja and really enjoys sneaking up on me, especially when I'm working. So you might need to be a wee bit of a he's behind you if you see him coming through that door behind me. Um, but hopefully they've been, they promised me they'll be good, so hopefully we won't get interrupted. Um, so first of all, who am I? So the really important thing to note, first of all, is that I am not a data scientist. Um, what I have done for the last 20 odd years is I've basically made data useful for CEO, CTO, board member, high exec kind of a level. Um, and basically I kind of describe it as I remove the hype and I deliver value from data. Uh, and currently I'm head of data science for Standard Life Aberdeen, which if you don't know is a merger between Standard Life and Aberdeen Asset Management. So a really big asset manager um, in the UK. Prior to that, two years at Clydesdale Bank, 10 years at Sky, Scottish Power, travel companies, etc. So I've worked in a lot of different industries. So what I'll try and do as we go through is hopefully try and pepper some of the pepper some of my experiences just into the into these sorts of into this uh, chat just to make it useful. Um, there is a Q&A box, so please make the most of it. I'll try and check in with it every now and again. It'll just make it a little bit less dry if people can ask questions. So We'll get started. I think before we get started, it's important to talk about where I think we are just now as an industry and where we are in, in kind of data terms. And from my point of view, these are the halcyon glory days of machine learning. I believe we're going to look back on these few years and, and this is this is going to be the time where we had the autonomy. We, we got, you know, this was where things were really, really sweet. Um, you, everyone's heard the data is the new oil, but, but literally I've just joined a fairly conservative um, asset manager company who has not only hired a head of data science, but also allowed me to hire three data scientists during a pandemic. So we've got the exec buy-in, not just in my company, but a number of other companies across the, uh, across the UK, across the globe, that data is really important and we can invest in it. Um, CDO, Chief Data Officer, is not an unusual job title anymore. So there's a, more and more companies are starting to hire these high hitter data people um, and, and electing them to the board. There's one problem, and I think the problem is that the bubble might burst if we're not careful. And that's really what I want to talk about here is how are we making value out of machine learning and how are we basically making the most of the opportunities that we've got here. So the bubble might burst. 
what, what you're talking about, Thorin, that doesn't make any sense. Like I say, all the press is saying, this is where we're going, it's incredible, data is new oil, you can't, you can't go wrong, you get a data science degree, you're, there's new gold-plated career choice, all that kind of chat. For me, a lot of the companies I've spoken to, and I've just, I've only been in this job since June, so when I was looking to try and change, change roles, I was speaking to a number of different high-profile companies, and they were all saying the same thing, which is we've invested millions in data science, big data clusters. We've hired data scientists. We've got some experiments. We've got some prototypes, but what, we're not really getting much value. We don't really know where we're going. We're a wee bit directionless. Can you help us? And that's very much where Standard Life was in terms of can you try and bring some, uh, some kind of clarity to what we're looking to do? Um, I'm going to be honest, in a lot of cases, that means that data science is seen as an extension of academia. So there's a lot of people who have drunk the Kool-Aid and believe that data science will answer the questions you didn't think to answer. So basically just fire, fire all these people in the room, give them a big data cluster, um, and then that's fine. They will just go off and they will just create magic and they will create this incredible insight that you didn't even think to look at. And as a result, my belief is that most teams don't have a commercial target. So most teams are seen as very much it's a it's an R&D department, it's skunk works, it's, you know, it's just a little, not play, but it, it's an expensive way to just go and experiment and see what you can do. And it's important, I think that's a problem, but it's important to work out, you don't really see that's a problem until you understand the funding model. And maybe not everybody, maybe few people on this call understand the funding model and understand why that's a problem. So I'm just going to quickly take you through that. So, if you're going to set up a new team in an IT department, you've got three options on how you're going to fund them. So option number one is what's called Spotify model, where you basically say it's a skunk works, we're going to fund them 100% and then we're just going to give them some priorities, give them loose guidance and they're just going to go off and do their stuff. And that's very much, there we go, that's what we're going to do. You've got your salary, knock yourself out. Option number two is 100% internal recharge back to projects. Now, what that means is from an accounting point of view, your IT team costs you nothing because every time a project is created, that project will consume those people and the, 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 um, the cost ultimately hits the project. From an accounting point of view, that's great because if your chief technology officer gets shouted at because IT are too expensive, what you can say is, well, the minute you guys stop pushing through business change, I can just get rid of all these people. Now, in reality, that's not going to happen because there's a constant change going on all the time. Um, so what it means is that you've just got that accounting simplification that says IT costs this, and that will be the people who are looking after the databases, the people who are looking after you know, the kind of run teams, and then everybody else is a change team, and that's just completely transparent. It's 100% chargeback. Or you've got hybrid of the two, and what you might have is you might have a 60% target, an 80% target that says 60, 80, 90% of your day has to be working on particular projects, and then the rest of it can be charged to other things. That's generally where I think most IT departments are, is that they're on, they're on the option number three. And um, my feedback is that, say you're a, you're a Java development team or you're a, a .NET team or something, most of those departments will be running on a CapEx rate of 80, 90%, something like that, allowing for holidays and these sorts of things. And what that means is, I, if, if most of IT is a, a hybrid model number three, and most of the data scientists are number one, what it means is the data scientists look really expensive. So say your team, you've got five people earning 50 grand a year. So that's, you know, boss, straight away, you're into the hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. Then you want an AWS cluster, then you want to buy some cool data, and then you want to, you need someone to look after that AWS cluster. You're talking about half a million to a million quid, bang, no problem at all. And that's an, a cost that entirely hits the, the, the profit and loss of the company. You can't recharge any of that. And it just looks like quite an expensive team. I can see some questions coming in already, which is really good. Um, let me get to, uh, thank you Miro for those questions. Let me get to them in a, in a wee minute. So that's the funding model. And I think it's really important to hear about that is because what it means is your CTO is seeing all these salaries and going, oh, those boys and girls look quite expensive. I, mean, I wonder what they're up to. So we're in the middle of a pandemic, it's law for me to have a COVID uh, slide because everybody is living and breathing it. But 
if we look at what's happened, COVID has de decimated people's lives and, and has caused you know, a huge amount of suffering. But it's also caused, if people haven't been directly affected by COVID, some people have lost their jobs, some people are, are looking at different scenarios, maybe you, you, your, your life has changed considerably. If I take my personal example, um, I finished up work in December with a plan to spend maybe two months, three months, possibly four months with my new daughter, um, who just turned one, and my wife who was on mat leave. And then it's all going really well, life's going really sweet until you get to March and a pandemic happens. And suddenly all the jobs that were available start to drop off a cliff. And suddenly you're looking at it going, hmm, I might be out of work for a wee while longer. Maybe I'll be six months, maybe I'll be nine months, maybe I'll be 12 months. So our family, just like a lot of other families, have to sit down and look at their own expenses and say, right, you know, where, where are we? Um, you're looking at decisions you made six months ago that looked absolutely sensible and you're now saying, hmm, that's maybe not looking quite so sensible anymore. You know, we're all going to be working from home in the foreseeable future. You, you start to make different, different choices. And our companies are the same. So companies have made decisions 6, 12, 18 months, two years ago. And now suddenly COVID's changed the world. If you're in retail, you know, people aren't going to shops. You have to pivot your operating model. You know, the, the, the banks are struggling. The big department stores are struggling. So a lot of companies that would have had a brilliant profit and loss and would have looked fantastic are suddenly going, oh, you know, things that things have massively changed. And the reason I mentioned this is this is what companies are going through. And my worry is our data, data science teams on a shaky peg, like my car was in March. So in March, my, my massively supportive wife and I sat down and we looked at my car through the do we really need it lens. Now, as a car enthusiast, that's a really uncomfortable lens to put any of my spending through because it just life just becomes a bit complicated. So the first question you ask is, what does this car do for us? Now, the embarrassing question is a lot of that comes from my ego. It makes me happy, I see it, I've worked really hard for it, it's in the garage, it makes me happy, blah, 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 blah. But in addition to that, it takes my son to football lessons and I can take him out to Taekwondo practice. Yeah, but Mark, none of that's happening at the moment because we're in a pandemic and it's all shut down. So you then start to have a, a conversation that says, well, what would the impact be if we didn't have it? You start going, well, we still got your car and you know, we do live in the city, so we don't really need two cars. And you start chatting around it. Well, what, what would happen if we had to get rid of it? And then the conversation says, can we get similar or the same benefits for less money? And you go, oh, well, yeah, I guess I mean, what you really need is four wheels. And, you know, I don't really leave the city anymore. So you could actually make some changes. And, and there's a lot of emotion there. There's a lot of backwards and forwards. But ultimately, these are really sensible questions to, to ask. And... The, these, this is what's happening, you know, this is what's happening in, in families up and down the line. And, you know, my new Fiesta, honestly, it's absolutely fine. It's totally the right thing to do, you know, ah, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe a wee bit sad, but, you know, it's the right thing to do, really supportive of my family to do this, you know. And I'm not crying, I'm sad, just a wee bit of dust in my eye, you know, just sometimes just blinks away, dust comes from the ceiling, you know. But, so joking aside, if, if you have to have that as a, as a personal conversation, and every, hopefully some people can relate to those sorts of conversations where we start saying, how can we do that? The question is, could your team pass that test? If your company did the equivalent of what we had to do with our expenses and look and say, we really like that, we don't want to get rid of it, but is it, is it standing the test of time? So could your team pass the test? So the first question is, is anyone relying on your output to run the business? And that relying word is key. So that means, is there somebody that if you don't exist, if your algorithm doesn't run one morning, if your system falls over, there is somebody in the business jumping up and down saying, I can't run my company without it. You know, so I used to run um, a, a part of the Sky platform where we, we did the recommendations engine for Sky Q. So when you log into Sky Q, it would basically say, because you like this, you might like this, that sort of stuff. And that was all built of viewing data that I looked after. Now, we could probably get away with the system being down for a day. Two days, it started to get data, we get a bit aged and maybe it wouldn't look great. Um, but, you know, we could get away with it. Day three, people would start to really get angry. And that's when you start to see the difference between something that's an experiment and something that's really, really relied on. So if you're a data scientist, if you're an aspiring data scientist, if you're working on stuff, the question is, is somebody relying on it? Or is it just interesting? And this is where we have to be honest with ourselves. I had a boss many moons ago who, when he was asked to do anal analytics, he would come and say, he would say, well, what are you going to do with the output? And the question would be, oh, well, yeah, we'll answer, oh, yeah, we'll do stuff with it. 
And he would always get him to think about it on two, on, on two fronts. If that metric is as bad as it can possibly be, what are you going to do? And if it's as good as it can possibly be, what are you going to do? And if the answer to both questions was, well, it'll just be interesting, then you don't need this analytics. It's not going to add enough. It's just going to be noise. So he would actually refuse to do that analysis. More often than not, he would then get forced into doing it. But he was like, I'm not, there's no point in creating analytics. It's just going to be interesting. It needs to be value add. It needs to be something that people are actually using. And similarly, is someone prepared to pay for your current output? So I, I think back in the day when we were at Sky, people were using Toad as a SQL client. And you could always hear it because you'd hear it ribbit when somebody started it up. And we tried to push people onto a free tool. And everyone was like, oh, this is ridiculous. The free tool is nowhere near as good. Toad is fantastic. And we're saying, well, yeah, it might be fantastic, but it's costing us a hundred grand a year and the other tool is free. So we devised a thing with the, with the engineers where we said, if you want to keep Toad, you have to pay us 50 quid a year. That's it, just 50 quid. We'll take out your salary. You can keep your Toad. Do you know how many people were prepared to pay 50 quid for it? Not one single person. And it was one of these things that they liked it. They liked having it but no one was actually prepared to put them, their hand in their pocket and pay for it. And if you're on the Spotify model and you're creating algorithms for your, for your, for your uh, department, for, for your company, that's, people are essentially getting that for free. So if they had to go to bat and ask for 250 grand worth of funding, that's when you see the differences. How much do they really want it? How much do they rely on it? And the other question I would ask is, have you measured your contribution? So even if people like it and it's not, in, it's not just interesting and people are prepared to pay, what difference does it make? Have you measured the difference that if the, when this algorithm runs, your profit per customer goes up by 10%? Or when this algorithm runs, you're, you, you've now managed to increase the efficiency of that process so much that where it used to be a team of 10, it's now a team of five. That you can measure it there. You can actually say, well, that's fine. I now can, uh, I can quantify what, what these things are doing. Okay, so you're sitting there, especially some of the guys and girls who are doing degrees and, and, and work, wanted to be a data scientist, they're like, oh, you were, you were, you're a bit funny at the start, and now you're starting to worry me. Maybe it wasn't even funny, but hopefully it was. Now you're worrying me. What? The answer is, you might be fine. There's a really good chance you will be fine, but I really would rather people had that conversation up front. I would really rather that people start to have that preparation to say, the more prepared you are right now, the better. If you can start to have that conversation, I don't think there are any downsides at all. For you starting to push the business or starting to push it or starting to think yourself, who's using it, why are they using it, what are we gonna do? If you can get yourself into that mindset, I think that makes you a better data scientist. If it makes you a better data engineer, it makes you a better business analyst, it makes you a better head of data science, whatever your role title is. If you're involved in ML, then I think these questions in the back of your mind, just nagging you away, will really, really help you. Okay, so what can you do? How can you help? Where can you go? My biggest piece of advice is, you need to be ruthless. And I really can't stress this enough, ruthless. So I have a bit of work at the moment that I won't go into too much detail, but the guys have been working on it for a year before I joined. And it's a pretty good bit of kit. Bit of kit. I'm pretty pleased with it. You know, I'm looking at it going, yeah, I can really see that working. The stakeholder wants us to work on it for an additional year to basically add more features, develop it out for different territories, look at different asset classes for it, those sorts of things. And I'm looking at it going, okay, as a commercial guy, as a guy who brings commerciality to, to machine learning, if I invest a year's worth of my guy's time in this tool, what am I going to get? And is it going to be better than a year spent doing building something else from scratch? So you really have to start having these ruthless conversations that say, this might make it better, but do the business care? And I'll give you an example. We built something in uh, Clydesdale Bank where we were looking at business customers and essentially each uh, custom, each business account manager had about 400 companies that they were looking after. And on a daily basis, it was basically throw a pin, throw a dart at the wall and work out who you're going to phone. And there was nothing more advanced than that. Other than some of them would say, I'll phone them every three months, I'll phone them every six months. We built an algorithm that said where they were in the life cycle and what products we thought they were about to take. So somebody might be about to take an asset, an asset, uh, asset finance product from the bank. So we, we did that and we basically gave them a curated list that said, here are the people you should phone this week 
and here are what we think they're interested in. From our point of view, it was version one, pretty shonky, but it, let's try it as an experiment. And we got to the stage where the sales guys loved it. And they loved it so much that we were talking about trying to get them to do a funding request so we could take it to the next stage. And they said, no, we, we don't want to. This is good enough for us to use. You could, they couldn't get the justification. They didn't think they'd be able to justify spending another, say, quarter of a million quid developing it further because it was already giving them value. And if we spent a quarter of a million quid, it might give them 5% more value, 10%, but it wasn't going to give them a quarter of a million quid's worth of value. So you have to be ruthless in terms of commercially, is this the right thing to do? You have to challenge your stakeholders to put a value in your work. It's really hard for me in a brand new business, in an industry that I, I haven't worked in before, to start to say, you know, my boss says to me, what value has that algorithm delivered? I can't answer that question. So I have to go to my stakeholders and say, well, what value? Now, stakeholders are busy, they've got other things to do. I just sometimes get, no, I'll give you a little bit and just to make you go away. But you have to challenge them. You have to really push them to say, no, no, hold on. If this algorithm is making you more efficient, have you reduced the size of your team? No. Okay, what are they able to do now that they weren't able to, with that free time we've given them? Well, that's a really good question. I'll go and find out. And it's that level of polite but firm challenging to say, you need to give me the insight to say what my, what my algorithm is doing. What, how is it making the world a better place? This is an interesting one. And it's, again, it's related to the academia point. Intellectually interesting is not the same as commercially viable. Sometimes they're complete polar opposites. So especially if you go into a fairly conservative company, if you go in expecting to do deep neural networks, it's not going to happen. I often used to joke about one of my past employers that frequency counts in SQL would have blown them away with the complexity of it because they were an Excel-based company. You know, so anything more advanced than that, they were like, wow, that's witchcraft. So often the stuff that's really commercially viable is linear regression. And added to that, you can explain it to people. So people like that. So if you go into this saying, I want to go and do an extension of my PhD thesis, it might work, but there's a lot of, there's a good chance that you're going to do something that you're going to find something that's interesting, but it's not going to generate that revenue. The plus point is what you can do is you can do some of the boring work that frees up some time to do the more interesting what I call pro bono work. So in the same way lawyers talk about doing pro bono for free because it's stimulating and makes them feel less like blood sucking evil people. You know, that we could do the same. You can basically say, here's your dog food. This is the stuff that's really just bread and butter and this gets the money into the department. And that means that one day a month, you can go and do something more interesting. And if you look at some of the, um, as I said, big car guy, the engineers, the, J the Japanese and German car engineer companies, the, the big engineering based car companies. So like your BMW, your Porsches, your um, Toyota, these sorts of things, Honda they allow their engineers to have days off once a week, once a month to go and work on whatever they want. So it just means if you're working on a light cluster housing or something and it's not particularly stimulating, you know that come Friday you've got, you can go and work whatever you want. And some of the cars and vehicles that I cover most are the ones that have been built by these skunk work teams after hours or in an afternoon or something. And that's where it can be really, really exciting. The other thing you can do is you can become a bit of a salesperson. And that's not a dirty word. I think salespeople get a bad rep, MBN guys excluded, obviously. But, you know, the, the salespeople, if you can do a sales job on what you're building, I think it really helps to get that value and ha have that value exchange with the business. But it's not a natural, it's not something that naturally comes to a lot of the data scientists I've worked with because it doesn't, it's, the two disciplines are quite, are quite different. I'm a big wavy hand salesperson that will just kind of find the two facts and then just go off and kind of BS the rest where a data scientist tends to be more, a bit more precise. So how can I help people become a bit more of a salespeople? Um, and thank you for the, thank you for the questions. Keep, keep them coming in as well. I'll, I'll, I'll just rattle through the next few slides and we'll start going through some questions. So the first thing you can say, I, I touched on it before, this isn't academia. And because it's not academia, I don't need to see your workings. If I've hired a data scientist and you've passed the test and you've got into the company, you, you're clever. I know you're clever. You're far more clever than me. I know you can do your job. I need to see the output. I don't really care that much about how you got there. 
you know, if, if, I, if it doesn't smell right, I'll ask the questions. But the stakeholders, even more so, they're really not bothered about whether what isolation tree algorithm you've used. They don't really care how you got to the answer you got to. All they care about is, I started here, we did some magic, and we ended up here. You might find some stakeholders who want a bit more detail, but generally, if they're a business person, all they care about is, the magic's done it. The magic box in the corner's done it. Here's my output. And I can't stress enough, if something didn't work, it's a footnote. There was one company I worked for where the data scientist did a, a two-pager on, the, on the, the bit of work they'd done. And going into it, we thought that it was going to detect fraud. We were quite excited about it detecting fraud. The long story short, it didn't. And that's sometimes what happens, right? There is no correlation. The, the hypotheses you went in, in with didn't work. About a quarter of this two pager was spent talking about fraud. And it was the second paragraph talked about fraud. So you, you start reading it and you go, oh, this is exciting, it's gonna detect fraud. And then you find that, oh no, the fraud stuff didn't work. And as a salesperson, you go, well, why is it in there? Why are you, why are you dangling that wee carrot? Say, oh, look what you could have had, and then snatching it away. From my point of view, if fraud did, if that bit didn't work, it's a footnote. Somebody might ask you, oh, by the way, can you tell me, did you not consider this for fraud? And you go, oh, we did look at it, couldn't find the correlation. But when you're selling it, don't talk about the stuff that didn't work. And it, it's, it sounds easy to do, but academia, I think, um, it's been a long time since I've been in academia, teaches you to, to give everything out. And I think that's where you just need to kind of hide some of this stuff. And led on from that, the how you got there isn't as interesting as the why. So like how you got to where you got to, I'm not really that bothered or the stakeholders aren't really that bothered. They care about the output. They care about the why is this important. They care about the where did we get to and what, how is this going to help me? So other sales stuff. Can you describe it in a paragraph? Now, if you're an academic sort and you've, dev you've, you've devoted an entire year to one project, somebody like me saying, can you distill that down to a paragraph is just a horrible thing because you're like, well, well, no, because there's so much nuance and there's so much stuff to go through. And it makes me sound like a total heathen. The problem is the people I speak to on a daily basis have literally got 10 minutes to listen to what I'm going to say. If I can't give them a paragraph to explain why it's not working, I've just lost them. Even a one pager, I've just lost them. I'm not going to get their attention. So if you can't describe it in a paragraph, the, the example I always give for those of you who follow me on LinkedIn, I talk about, can you explain it to my mum? My mum is a 72 year old retired college lecturer. She's not a thick woman, but she doesn't understand machine learning. Um, she was delighted when I worked for Sky because that's TV. I can understand, oh, you work for the TV company, that's great. And now in asset management, she's the one I don't, don't really understand anymore. So can you explain it to my mum? Would my mum be able to explain it if you spoke to her for a couple of minutes? And you need to practice the art of basically dropping a lot of the stuff that isn't valuable and actually just saying, this is the core. There's a term in marketing called USP, which is universal selling point. And it's basically, why should I care? What makes this different from the other thing I was going to buy? So if you think about it in terms of buying a product, why should I buy an iPhone over an Android phone? Why should I go and buy a BMW over an Audi? What is it that's different about those two items that makes it worth, worth my attention? And that's the USP. You need to think about your algorithms in terms of that. A really interesting one, especially in corporate land is, why would we pay you to build it? Why wouldn't we just buy it? If you're a CTO, if you're a CEO, you are getting bombarded every day of the week with companies offering you an AI solution. Now you and I know it's not AI, right? It's, a, it's an if then else chart, but they don't know that. And so they're getting bombarded with all these companies saying, we've already done all the hard work. You just turn this system on and it's gonna start delivering value overnight. So you need to have thought about that already because how are you gonna pitch your solution against this other company that may or may not exist? Why wouldn't you just buy it? And there's gonna be really good reasons why not. You just need to tease them out. And then the kind of final salesperson one is what I do is I try and get people to boil it down into three buckets. So some of this is maybe asset management specific, but I think it works across a lot of industries. Is this algorithm going to make us more money, avoid us losing money, or make us more efficient? There might be a fourth bucket that someone can, someone can tell me about, but those are the three that the more I think about it, the more I think those are the ones that really, that really start, start to make a difference. So if you can think about your algorithm, if your algorithm is spanning two of them, you need to think about how you're selling it. 
and you need to bake it down to which one's the most important. And again, that's going to sound like sacrilege because it's somebody's life project. Somebody's lived and breathed this for a year. And I'm sitting here from my basement going, nah, just make it one selling point. It, it doesn't sound right. But interestingly, James Dyson, when he originally developed the Dyson vacuum cleaner, you may or may not know, but Dyson also sell a powder that you can scatter onto your carpet and it's like dry cleaning your carpets. He invented that at the same time he invented the cyclone technology. So that's what cyclone, that's the hand movement for cyclone. Um, and, but what he identified was, if you read his autobiography, the cyclone was so revolutionary that he didn't want to go in with two revolutionary ideas because people would just think it was snake oil and wouldn't believe it. So he went in with the cyclone technology and just kept the other stuff quiet. And once you've bought into it, well, I believe you, I think the cyclone technology is working and then you start getting at that conversation. You go, and it's also really good at being a dry cleaner because the dust doesn't get clogged up in the bag, etc. And it's that sort of thinking when you go, what am I going to lead with? So you need to lead with, it's going to make you more money. CEOs love that. It's going to avoid you losing money, not quite as attractive, but still attractive. And in the current climate, it's going to make you more efficient. Brilliant. That means I can sack some people. You know, I'm being deliberately like, vicious, but those are the ways that some of the people at the top think. And if you can think about your algorithm in those terms, it'll help you sell it a lot better. So I'm going to go to get to Q&A in a minute, but to bring this to a close, to kind of highlight what I've been talking about, you need to think like an evil corporate bean counter. Because if you don't, and one of them exists in your company, they're going to ask awkward questions. So if you can think about those questions in advance, the questions are not hard, but if you can, they're only hard if you're not prepared for them. So you need to think in advance, how am I going to answer these questions when they come along? You need to think about how is this output going to change your company? And if it's not going to change the company, is it good enough? It needs to be something where you can talk about in that passionate way about it's going to revolutionize, it's going to you completely transform. Those are the sorts of words that get people fired up and people go, oh, I like that. It's not natural for Scottish people, especially to talk about that. It's not natural for Scottish people to stand up and go, here, mate, it's going to change your company. It's going to blow your mind because we're naturally quite reserved. But that's the way we need to talk about it. If we're, if we're going to continue to get the funding and continue these glory days, we need to be pushing this sort of stuff. Another one that's quite successful is what happens if we don't do it? Now, in my industry at the moment, super competitive. And it's basically about why would somebody invest in one of our funds versus somebody else's fund? And if we don't do this, if we don't invest in machine learning, well, BlackRock are doing it, all the other investment houses are doing it. So it's not just that we need to do it to gain a competitive advantage. We need to do it to stay still. You know, when you can start to have those conversations to start saying, well, everyone else is doing it. And it's not in that really tired big data analogy about teenage sex. It's not like that. It's not saying everyone else is doing it, so, so do we. It's more about everyone else is doing it, so we need to be better. We need to push that. And finally, we need to think about, is it more important than Project X? Now, you probably won't know what you're up against, but at a corporate level, they're going to be making decisions about, right, what am I going to spend? We've got some cash to invest in the company. What are we going to spend it on? Some of the things you're not going to win against, we're going to upgrade to Windows 10. We're going to put in Office 365. We're going to go and build a new premises. We're going to do something like that. You're not going to win against that. But somebody somewhere is going to be saying, I want to do a Salesforce upgrade. Or I want to go, for, go up to, want to replace all our Oracle boxes. I want to move from an on-prem database, all our on-prem stuff into the cloud. You need to make sure that your project and your team and your output is deemed more important than those projects or as important as those projects. Because if you can't explain it in a way that, that people will understand, the funding's gonna to go to other places. And the more you can do to try and say, you don't need to say here, this is better than investing in Oracle because you, you won't know what's going on. But if you can think about it in those terms, in terms of if money is tight, why should I give money to your team versus somebody else? And that's the key for me is being a bit paranoid not losing sleep over it at night, because I do believe it's a fantastic industry and it is growing. I just don't want us to get complacent. So, any questions? There are already some questions in, which is good. Um, a great question from Alan Stevenson. Um, should data science teams sit within IT and or should they not, should they not hold themselves accountable? I.e. view a business function, we think you can make and save you money by doing X. It's a really good question because 
a lot of times if you sit it in the business, I don't think there's a right answer. If you sit it in the business, the problem is it looks like quasi IT. So in, in order to make data science work correctly, in my view, you need to have some autonomy over the platform you're on. So you need to be able to look after parts of your AWS cluster. And naturally what you're then going to be doing is you're then going to be stepping on the toes of the people who are already looking after that class, already looking after the on-prem database. So if you keep it in the business, you've got that, that real tension. If you keep it in IT, all the things I've talked about already are a big problem. You look expensive compared to everyone else and it could potentially be viewed as a, as a business problem. So I don't think there's a right answer. I think it sits more in IT than the business. Um, but simply because the complexities of cloud, especially the cloud charging model, means that you need to be on top of that um, and you need to be really, really close to technology because otherwise we've all worked with tools that just don't work. Um, Gavin Allen will remember that in cloud steel. You know, if you've got a cluster that's not performant, it's really, really difficult to do machine learning. Um, Rob, feel free to jump in at any point, by the way. I can see you've, you've come off mute. I was actually just throwing something in the chat there to encourage folks to answer, ask some more questions, but I'm just going to do a host prerogative here for two seconds. Oh. As you were going through, I was picking out a couple of things there, and, and I noticed an emphasis on marketing, an emphasis on sales, and a little bit of a dip into product, right? My question to you, sir, is this, and I'm talking here about your, 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 the mention of academia. Do we need to fundamentally change how data science is taught. Do we need somebody to come up with an MSc in commercial data science, incorporating those lessons in marketing, sales and product? That's a really good question. Thank you, mate. <laughs> so I think there would be, I'll answer it in a slightly different way. I am not data science taught. I come from a traditional MIBI background. I have managed to teach myself enough about data science. Some of the guys on this chat who used to work for me might disagree, but I think I've taught myself enough about data science and machine learning to be able to run the team and passionately advocate why we should be doing things in a certain way. So I'm not sure I would necessarily change the way that data science is taught because I do worry, you'll have seen, seen them Rob and Michael, I think Pete's on the call as well. The number of head of data science roles where you're meant to be proficient in Python mm -hmm. and also a kind of rock star corporate god. Yep. I'm a bit worried that the skill set that you require to be a really, really good machine learning engineer or a really good data scientist, I'm not sure that's the same skill set that, or it's a complementary skill set to what allows you to be that kind of corporate animal. There will be people like, so um, some of you may know Ali K. Miller. Um, she works for AWS, Amazon Web Services. If you find her on, uh, you'll find her on Instagram and, and LinkedIn. She is business development for, for AI for AWS. And she is what I, she's like a proper rock star in terms of, she is very commercial. She's very personable. She's very, very corporate friendly. And she's also a trained data scientist. And Cassie Kozikov from Google, is, I think is similar. But in my experience, these people tend to be the unicorns and not the not everybody. So I think it would definitely be helpful in the way we've talked about before, Rob, like in a data science course, it'd be helpful to talk about how to clean data sets because yeah. otherwise you come out of data science thinking the world is rosy and then you suddenly end up, you're spending 80% of your time data wrangling. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be a bad thing to to do, but I wonder if the better way to do it is to tweak some of the more business focused courses to help people understand machine learning a bit better. I wonder if that more naturally, that skill set more naturally lends it to it. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions on that, but I, I, do, I do think there is definitely a role for, I call myself a translator. So I can talk C-suite, I can talk to a CTO, and I can talk to data scientist. Neither of them maybe particularly likes me or rates me, but I can talk to both of them and I can translate what they're saying. And I don't think you realize you need that role until you try and get a business sponsor speaking to a data scientist. And unless they're very experienced in, in unless they're both very experienced in dealing with each other, you can just have a conversation that does that. Uh, and that becomes that becomes really, really hard. 
I've got a follow-on question on that particular point, but I'm going to leave me just now. So I'm going to dip back into chat. Miro's, Miro's asked a number of questions here. Um, the first one that, that I'm looking at here is, is, is data science and financial services more challenging compared to non-FS, for example, your experience at Sky, given the regulatory requirements and the culture? So was it more difficult with an F? Is it, is it more difficult with an F than non-FS? And why? What's the most striking difference? So the answer is yes, it's more difficult. The reason isn't regs, because the regulators have kind of given up on trying to regulate the industry, and now what they're talking about is guidance. So if you look at the, the FCA, um, the, oh, I can't remember the, the different acronyms, but all the different regulatory bodies, um, the Potential Risk Authority, Financial Conduct Authority, they give guidance now that says, and basically the guidance says, don't be a dick. You know, and that, that's basically it. And it, it, it goes out like over five pages, but it's basically don't be a crook, don't do, don't do anything too bad and just try and keep everyone honest. Where it's difficult is financial services companies are terrified of these regulatory bodies. And certainly when I was in Clydesdale, it's probably no secret that, that we really suffered with PPI. And a lot of the PPI stuff, the perception was that we were, we were on the right side of the law when we were selling it. And then the law maybe moved a wee bit and we suddenly started getting fines for it. There's a real worry in financial services that um, we, will, we will do something that at the time looks fine, but later on through a, through a kind of a different lens, it looks like we've done a bad thing. The other thing that I found really difficult in financial services was Sky were, if you got, if you got regulations in Sky and Ofgen, we were the weapon boy in Sky for Ofgen. They were absolutely after us for broadband all the time. What would happen is the lawyers in Sky would say to me, there's your box. I've looked at, the le I've looked at the, all the legal, I've looked at all the guidance, I've looked at all the governance, you can do this. That's your box, you can do whatever you want in that box. In financial services, what you tend to find from the governance teams is they give you the guidance, what do you think? And there was a number of conversations I got involved in once, well, well, I think I can do it. You're the one that's meant to be the police here to tell me I can't, you know? so. I, I very much thought that I should have been able to do more. We, we had access to everyone's banking transactions. I think we could have done some really cool stuff for good in terms of getting people out of financial, um, financial distress, spotting people going down a bit of a slippery slope. We could do all that with data science. We weren't ever, ever really able to do it because people were quite nervous about the regulations. Um, I think the other thing I would say about financial services is in a company like Sky, they are really worried about being undercut by Netflix, by all the other, you know, by, by whatever. They move really fast. So as a result, it's quite decisive and they're very commercially driven. So if you can say, I can build this and it's gonna save us half a percent, they'll go, go, do it. As long as you can get your return on investment in 18 months, you get the cash. The banks, asset managers, I think I'm gonna be honest, this has been recorded, so I need to be careful what I'm gonna say. I think a lot of them have made money quite easily in the past. And as a result, they don't have that same commercial lens. So if you're talking about, I can save you a hundred grand, there's almost a bit of, hey, well, you don't really need to save a hundred grand yet. I think that's changing, but, um, so I don't think it's regs. I think it's, it's attitude and often what I find is a lack of cross pollination. So any of you who are kind of my age will know that to get into financial services without a financial services background is really hard. That's changing now, but it was always, well, if you don't have FS experience, you can't get an FS job. So as a result, loads of the people I work with have been in the same company for 25 years. They're really clever people, but they've never worked anywhere else. So when you're coming in with slightly what they perceive to be off the wall ideas, because you're saying, well, I'll take it from retail, I'll take it from, you know, travel industry, whatever, they're a bit like, whoa, I've never seen, no one else is doing this in the industry. Yeah. But let's go and do it. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's it is harder, but not for the reasons you would think. Okay. So I've got a couple of Miro. I know you've asked another couple of questions. We're going to skip on. There are questions here I want to focus you on, eh, Martin. So Gavin and Nick. So Gavin's asked, do you think there's space for a dedicated role in between data science and the business? So that translator almost that you spoke about earlier. To manage ongoing projects with stakeholders and communicate in commercial terms, it could give those on the techie side more space to focus on the analysis and modeling while still ensuring commercial value is being delivered. 100%. also want to loop in next question. Next question is really interesting. Massive thanks to Martin for a great talk and some nice honesty. My question is just that given what you've said, is the title name data scientist 
kind of wrong. Scientists generally spend over 90% of their lives going down dead ends and into details. Do we need a new title of sorts? Data consultants. So it's that idea that, you know, this, from my perspective anyway, it's this, this idea that science is looking for almost a, a true answer, 100% mm -hmm. perfect answer. That's not what business needs. Gavin's point about that translating between yeah. the scientist and the business. Do we need to reinvent? I, I think we, I, I'm not sure we need to reinvent because I, I still, even though I've been a bit rude about data scientists, I can't do my job without them. And, and I've worked with some exceptional ones. And if you get the right data scientist, you, you can genuinely change the world in terms of what, what you can do. But I do think what you need is you need that translator role to help protect them and to make sure that they, I talk about in order for a project to be a success in my, in my area, I need a, a business area that want to work with us. And that sounds a bit obvious, but in a lot of companies, data science is seen, or AI in particular, when you, when you read all the press, it's seen as taking people's jobs. So they don't want to work with you because they quite like the way they're doing things. So I need a, comp a department that's going to work with me. I need someone who's enthusiastic. And, and I need someone who can just, who's got a cute problem that flatters the technology. And I think if you can find those three things, that really then means that the data scientist excels because the data scientist is working on something that, that's hit those three sweet spots. That means that whatever they produce is going to be brilliant. So I, I, I still think, I think data scientists could, it will be helpful if they were a little bit more commercial and a little bit less academic. That would be super helpful for me. So often what I say is if I, I, I had a CV the other day where the, uh, the individual had a PhD and three MSCs, I don't want to be rude, but almost straight off the bat, I look at that and go, mm, I'm not sure you're going to fit in. You know, if you've basically spent 10 years of your life and longer working solely in academia, I take you into the big bad corporate world. Nobody's going to enjoy that. The corporate world isn't going to get a lot out of you and you're not going to really enjoy it. So I think there's an element that maybe the data scientists need to be a bit less sciencey, but I also think there is this role that Gavin talks about um, where you can basically just talk to people. And a lot of what I do for a living is going around the business with people who think they've got a brilliant idea for data science and me basically telling them that they don't. You know, going, that's a great idea. I can solve that with SQL over here. I can run a Power BI report and with this team, go and speak to them, they can build it for you. And it's finding the gems that go, ah, that problem, that problem's perfect for me. Let's go and let's go and give that to the data scientist. So, so I, I I, I do think there is a role that is required that, that basically curates the backlog and, and kind of has a lovely curated and, and, and dressed up backlog so that by the time the project gets the data scientist, the data scientists go, oh, this is good. We can start to work on that. I don't think it's a, it, it seems a luxury role until you've seen the problems. And I think I have worked for a couple of data scientists who have literally said to me in the pub, what do you do all day? I don't get it. Why, why do you exist? And it's, only, and it's only when they've genuinely, and it's only when they've been forced to sit next to the stakeholder that they go, oh, you protect me from all that stuff. You know, so it, it, it's, it's that kind of a role, I think, where you're basically saying, these guys are my rock stars and I'm gonna keep them away from you until you've worked out what your problem statement is. And then once you've worked out what your problem statement is, then I'll bring in my guys. I do think there's a, there is a role for people who have maybe, and I'm seeing it more and more with like the Data Lab MSC, which I'm really excited about, people who come from a non-traditional background. So people who have come and then done an, maybe done a wee bit of work and then done a Data Science MSC, I think that's a really powerful combination. And when you hear the stories of the Data Lab guys and girls about the projects they've got involved in, I think that shows that they're not pure data scientists. They can do a big range of stuff. I think that's really powerful. And, if I got my way and the, my son's a long way away from getting to university, I probably wouldn't advocate him going down a pure data science route. I would want him to be a bit more, you know, do that MSc, but do the MSc after you've done something different, you know, and, and I think there's, there's no right and wrong way to do it, but I think that probably makes you look a wee bit, it, to me, if I'm hiring, that makes me step set up a bit more and go, oh, that's an interesting CV. Let's have a conversation. Yeah. And, and it was just, from my own personal perspective, and my, my son has, has literally this week started his, his first day, or well, his first week of an undergrad maths and stats course 
with a view to becoming a data scientist. What he did before that was to go in and spend a month and, 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 and kudos to Duncan Bain and Scottish Power because he went in and he worked on a commercial data science team for a month to make sure that he did want to go through the maths and stats and MSc route. He wanted to, to work in a commercial data science team. I just want to bring it back a wee bit there because it, it would seem, and, and I'm talking here both on an individual level from the individual data scientist, but also from the, 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 the dynamic of the team, does the personality and nature of a typical data scientist slash team need to change? Because we're talking here about individuals who are often slightly introverted or teams that could have an introvert outlook. You just spoke about the conversation in the pub with somebody who, who genuinely didn't realise what you were exposed to. And, and come back to your comment to earlier on about, about, I never ever considered myself a sales guy, but sales is a natural part of what I do, so I just have to do it. But do we need to change that personality and nature of the data science function at, a, at an individual and unit level? I think if you're in a big company, you don't need to because you're big enough that you've got somebody like me and you've got other data translators that mean you don't need to change. And you've got enough throughput of projects that means you genuinely can get away with having the more introverted people. I think the smaller the company, the more you need that unicorn, the more you need that hybrid where you're basically saying, I probably care less about your PhD and I probably care more about your, your um, I don't want to say personal skills because data scientists still have personal skills because they're still people, right? But I, I care more that you you are you want to spend time writing a PowerPoint. So there's there's a really good example. A lot of data scientists, as part of their role, will have to do a bit of presentation layer stuff. So you'll do a, you'll do some kind of shiny dashboard or or whatever. And generally, what I find is people like doing that one. There you go. I've knocked it up, and then they want to give it to someone else to look after. And that's where, it, that's where you really find that people can get, oh, I, I want to purely focus on data science. The smaller the company, I think the harder it is to be that purist. You know, I think the smaller the company, the, the, the more you need to be a bit more of a generalist. And I think that's probably where you can get, like, like say, the data lab experience, or you've got people that we've got. Um, I, I, I saw a CV this morning from somebody who was an actuary who's done an MSc. We've got asset managers who've done MSCs. You know, you've got people who have maybe being a, a Java developer who's now in the MSC. I think that different approach probably lends itself better to the smaller companies. But there will always be, you know, there will always be big enough companies that can just, that can afford to have huge groups of slightly more insular, slightly more stereotypical scientists sitting in, in, a, in a lab working away. But I think you, you probably, there's no, there's no wrong path, right? That's, that's, what, that's what everyone yeah. always says. I didn't end up in this job by planning. It just kind of evolved into this. But I think if you've got that hybrid, it's better for a smaller company. Sure. Going to swing away now. We've got a great question here from Solmage. And I know this is something that you and I have discussed um, at length in the past. Your views on the ethics of using AI and is it being you and it being used for decisioning? So my slightly contentious view is I don't see it any different as the way we are currently doing decisioning. So I'll take my retail banking experience, two years at Clydesdale Bank, they were obsessed about what happens if we make the wrong decision, the bad, big bad algorithm makes the wrong decision. And if you've been following the news and about all these poor kids who've been, who got their, their marks downgraded, all the chat was about the algorithm downgraded them. And I'm like, no, it didn't. Somebody wrote that algorithm. Somebody trained that algorithm. The person that wrote and trained it didn't do the best job, or they were given the wrong instructions, or they were given the wrong guidance, or they were given the wrong goals. For me, ethics and AI, we're doing it just now. Back in the day when my, my dad's in his 70s, when my dad went for his first mortgage, you sat down with the bank manager, and the bank manager would approve your mortgage dependent on who your parents were and what they knew you got up to at the weekend. Because my dad lived in Helensborough, it was a wee town, everybody knew everybody. And there would be some people would get a mortgage and some people just would not get a mortgage. So a lot of this is, you use a great Scottish word, pish, talked about, <laughs> about ethics, right? This has been a problem since Adam was a boy. People have been incorrectly classifying people and, and doing bad things to people. I agree that when you start using AI and decisioning, it's got the potential to get out of hand 
off e quickly. You know, when you start looking at a lot of the um, a lot of the visual the visual rec recognition tools, a lot of the you know automatically scanning someone's face and working out if they're a criminal or not. Oh, absolutely, you give it the wrong training data, and it, it's going to make some really bad decisions. But for me, it's no different than we are currently. You go and use an insurance pricing engine just now. Why am I getting a different price for, for my lovely Fiesta, which I do actually quite like, by the way. But why do I get a different price for my Fiesta than my next door neighbor? Nobody can tell you why. They can give you hints as to why. But so I think it's important, but I think the importance that's been placed on it has been massively overblown by people that have watched The Terminator and Black Mirror far too many times and don't understand the technology. Um, Rob and I always talk about the Black Mirror episode with the robot dogs. You know, like, that's it. That's my worst nightmare is, you know, like an autonomous Boston robotics dog running around with a knife. I don't want that. We're some way away from that, you know, and I just think, I, I'll give you another good example. There are people currently in retail banks approving your mortgage who are 19 year old students who are hungover, who are flirting with the person next to them. Are they really any worse than an AI tool would be? You know, like they are not perfect. They are making mistakes right now. And the big companies know what that percentage mistake is. So I think it's really important, but I think it gets slightly overblown in terms of where, where people, someone I think people, front door. people, that's my Google tell me someone at the front door. Um, I think it gets slightly overblown with, with people just getting a little bit too panicky about it. It's important, but it's always been important. And no, we've not been talking about ethics in SaaS coding. We've not been talking about ethics in expert systems that have been about in banking since the seventies. You know, yeah. so it's important, but it's not. It's not the be all and end all. You need to go and get your door, fella. No, no, it's okay. I've got, I've got another part of my family for that. It's okay. No worries. We've gone over the hour mark, mate, which is great. But I wanted to go back to to one of Miro's questions. Um, and and this kind of harkens back to, we, we, we had a great conversation uh, recently with, with Harvinder uh, from Money Supermarket and his, his, his data ops book, when he spoke about the majority, of, a vast majority of data science projects failing. And Miro's question is, what's the key enabler, in your opinion, to success? And what's the biggest roadblock? Is it, is it an individual thing? Is it a personality? Is it a stakeholder? Is it a sponsor? Is it the team? It's picking the right project. I, I uh, honestly believe it's picking the right project in the first place. It, it's going to be a success if people are bought into it. So you could go and like take, take my, my world, for example. We could go and build an algorithm that would build the perfect as, asset class, it would build the perfect collection of stocks, and it would do that automatically. You have AI funds that are doing that just now. But do the company want it? Because I could build perfection, and if the company don't want to put their heart and soul into it, if they don't want to trust it, it's not going to happen. You know, so I've had, I won't name them, but I've worked on some projects that I thought are absolutely beautiful in terms of what they can do, and they've not been adopted. And I've often sat and thought, could I have done anything differently? But ultimately, if the business, if the business doesn't want to adopt it, it won't get adopted. So part of that is a sales job. How do you sell it? But there will be some things where turkeys don't vote for Christmas. And especially any of the ML that is looking to replace people or augment people, people are just really nervous about it. So for me, it's about being clear, what are we gonna do and why are we doing it? We are doing this to save money. We are doing this to employ more people, to make more money, to be more efficient. And as long as you're absolutely crystal clear and you've got high level buy-in to say, this is happening, I think that's what makes that's what makes these things successful. It's been really crystal clear on what you're trying to do. I think too many projects fail because they are led in this kind of a we will just throw data scientists at the data and we'll hopefully find an answer. If you've not got commercial buy into that, you're going nowhere. That's a great question just came in there from Brian. Thanks, Brian. Who in a company may typically be best placed to identify where value can be extracted from data? Who needs to be involved to create meaningful business proposals and cases where the core pound value may only be realized by implementing data science? So is it back to that translator or should this be somebody on the board or who's the best I, person? So I, think, I think there's part of the role for the translator, but I think the biggest problem is that a lot of these roles don't exist. So what you've got is a bit of blind leading the blind. You've got the board approving something up here, 
and the data scientist delivering it down here and there's a big mess in the middle to try and do it so i think in terms of identifying the value you need somebody like me I, i'm going to say that because it, it helps my role and it helps my you know i think every company needs me and i should be paid twice as much as i'm paid just now but you know i think i think there is a role for a me for a translator for a for a kind of curator of these things as long as they're working in conjunction i'm really fortunate in, in aberdeen standard that i've got stakeholders really senior stakeholders who really get it now they're really challenging and they ask lots of really awkward questions but they really get it and it, that really helps in terms of getting that business case and getting that buy-in but i think if you try and have the high level of the data scientist that would it, that's when it becomes really really hard and that's again coming back to kind of the, the, the point that was raised earlier about why do so many fail I think so many fail because it's just a mismatch and you've got a data scientist who's got five years experience which makes them ahead of data science trying to make a decision about a commercial world that they've maybe not had that much experience in. Okay, brilliant. Jill uh, has just raised her hand um, and I'm not sure whether she wants to type a question but I'm looking at my functionality here and I've got a button that says allow to talk. <laughs> allow Jill to talk to answer a question. new world. Or has she disappeared? Hold on, let's see if we can fix this. Jill, are you still there or have you disappeared? Right, here we go. Jill, I'm going to allow you to talk. Presumably you've got a question to ask. You need to take yourself off mute, Jill. Or maybe she doesn't. No, maybe she raised her hand in error, perhaps. <laughs> um, that's us came to the end of the questions within the Q&A. Jill, you're still on screen if you want to enable your mic and you want to ask your question. Um, it's going to be the last shout here. Um, there's a, a thank you coming in from Graham. Love this evening. Thank you very much indeed. It's the last hurrah. If anybody has a final question for Mr. Thorne, this is the time. And as I say, I might even enable you and allow you to be on screen with the man himself. It's kind of like um, superstar stuff here, mate. Mm -hmm. Anybody has any final questions, this is the time. You can raise your hand or type something in the box or whatever. I think that may be us. Nope, it looks we've got a few thank yous coming in. Right, okay, okay, I am going to wrap. Thank you all so very much for attending this evening. Thanks very much for all the great questions, interaction and chat. Trust me on this, guys. It does make our job so much easier when we've got this level of interaction. A massive thank you to my man, Mr. Thorne. It's always a pleasure hearing you speak, sir. You make me think every time I hear you talk. Thank you so much for giving me in your thank evening. To everyone else, if you, if you want to chat, ask questions, add me on LinkedIn um, and ping me a note and we can have a blather. But thank you very much for time. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks again, Martin. Thanks, everybody. Take Cheers. care. All the best. Bye-bye.